The oil industry is well aware of its responsibility for protecting the environment and conducting all of its operations in exploration for and production of gas and crude oil and in the refining, transportation, marketing, and use of finished petroleum products. The industry devotes a great deal of time, effort, and money in meeting this responsibility. In our industry, as in other industries, accidents can and do happen. Several large and dramatic oil spills have attracted widespread public attention, but such spills are infrequent. Smaller spills, though less dramatic, occur more often and may temporarily damage the environment unless they are handled promptly and effectively. This film illustrates current techniques of containing and recovering spilled oil. Real progress has been made, but more needs to be done to perfect technology to respond under severe weather and sea conditions. Various industries, many individuals, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Coast Guard, and the Navy are engaged in research and development to improve cleanup techniques. Related areas of concern, the prevention of spills, the fate and effect of oil on the marine environment, and other matters are also being vigorously pursued. All of the equipment shown in this film may not be readily available in all areas where oil spills may occur. Moreover, the use of sinking agents or dispersant chemicals may be restricted under certain conditions or in certain waters because of possible environmental side effects. We can't tell the whole story in 30 minutes, but we hope that this film, produced as a training aid, may prove helpful to those who must be prepared to deal effectively with oil spills. This is part of the commitment we all must make to safeguard the environment in which we work and live. Nobody likes oil spills, but they do occur, and they're everybody's business. The user is concerned about the damage they may cause, and the producer, the transporter, the refiner, and the marketer are concerned about preventing spills and cleaning them up. A large percentage of the total crude oil and oil products are produced, refined, and sold on or near waterways. At each stage, there is some risk that oil might be spilled. Oil spills do occur on land and on water. Crude oil from wells, tankers, and other sources. Product spills near docks or storage areas. When spills do occur, first contain it and then clean it up. That's the subject of this film. How to contain oil spills on water and how to remove it. Oil can be picked up if you have the right equipment and trained people who know how to use it properly. Before looking at the many different types of equipment which are available, let's look at some of the problems. Currents will always transport the oil and will also tax the strength and performance of your equipment. Wind will move the oil on the water surface, generally at about 3% of the wind velocity. And of course, wind can cause equipment to drift off location or sometimes to break. Waves can cause oil to splash over or be swept under barriers and can also damage them mechanically. Low temperatures can make working conditions difficult and low temperatures will also increase the viscosity and density of the oil. The degree and combination of these four conditions, wind, waves, current, and temperature will largely determine what you can and cannot do to contain and remove an oil spill. 
In addition to environmental conditions, oil spill containment and removal depends on oil properties. Many types of oil have been studied, from the heaviest crude oils to the lightest oil products that may possibly be spilled on water. The physical properties of oil, such as viscosity, specific gravity, and surface tension determine how they will behave when spread on water. These properties change with time, owing to evaporation or weathering. The viscosity and specific gravity of an oil always increase as a result of weathering, and crude oils always show greater changes than do the refined oils. Frequently, owing to wave action, the oil and water will tend to become emulsified, which further affects the properties of the oil and greatly affects cleanup operations. So far, we have talked about some of the factors involved in oil spills, including the properties of oil and how these properties change. We've also discussed some of the stumbling blocks which nature can throw in the way of oil spill containment and removal. Now, let's take a look at some of the equipment used to control oil spills. Oil spill control equipment takes many shapes from booms to skimmers and sorbents. None of this equipment can do the whole job of oil spill containment and removal by itself. But often, it is necessary to use several different types in conjunction one with another. Now, let's take a closer look at some of the equipment used to contain oil spills. A boom is a mechanical barrier to stop or direct the flow of oil. Booms have four basic parts. Some means of flotation is necessary to keep the entire boom at the correct position on the water and to ensure that the boom has enough freeboard to resist waves splashing over the top. Next, there must be a skirt to keep oil from flowing underneath the boom. Weights are usually added to the skirt to keep it perpendicular to the water surface. And finally, there is a longitudinal strength member, which must be strong enough to withstand winds, waves, and current. On a typical boom, these parts are easily recognizable. The flotation member, the skirt, weights, and the strength member. There are many makes of booms. They all have the same basic design. They all serve the same purpose, to control oil on water. We can divide booms into three basic categories. The flexible boom is very compliant, so it can follow wave action easily. Problems may come with overall strength, durability, and stability. Semi-flexible booms are composed of non-rigid sections joined by hinges. They are relatively compliant to follow waves, yet are simple to manufacture, store, and deploy. Rigid booms are among the largest booms in use today. Rigid sections are joined by hinges to provide flexibility. They are the most cumbersome to handle of the three types. If currents are low, oil can be contained by a boom. However, if the current is in excess of only seven-tenths of a knot, oil will go under the skirt of the boom, no matter how deep the skirt. This phenomenon can be demonstrated in a current tank, where water velocity and oil quantity can be controlled. Through a window in the side of the tank, boom failure can be observed. Oil begins to build up in front of the boom. As the current is increased, a head wave builds up upstream from the boom. Further increase in water velocity will cause droplets of oil to break off the underside of the head wave and go under the boom. If the water velocity is over seven-tenths of a knot, the boom can be used as a diversionary device by placing it at an angle to the current 
and leading the oil off to an area of lesser currents. The higher the current, the more the boom must be angled downstream. Wind and waves will make the handling of booms more difficult and will cause additional stresses on the boom. In the presence of waves, both water and oil can splash over the top of a boom, providing the wave height is at least as great as the freeboard of the boom, and the waves are steep as they normally are in a wind-driven sea. For this reason, a boom should have at least as much freeboard as the expected wave height. Preparedness, training, and fast action are the keys to minimizing damage from an oil spill. In this drill, an oil spill alert was called. Each man has his specific job. The equipment is properly stored, and in a matter of minutes, the boom can be deployed. Communication by radio between the supervisor and the boat crew is important. From water level, it is often difficult to determine the limits of an oil spill, particularly light products. However, from the vantage point of a dock or an elevation above water level, the limits of the spill can be determined and the boom properly anchored. In narrow inlets or slips, a line-throwing gun can be used to pass the tow line to the other side. Once the tow line is across the slip, it is simple to pull the boom in place. After a spill, all equipment should be made ready for its next use. It could happen at any time. Booms should be cleaned according to the instructions of the manufacturer and carefully inspected before returning to storage. The air barrier is still another oil spill control device. It can be used to contain oil if the current is very low, or it can be used to divert oil on a moving stream. It requires minimum manpower to operate and can be activated instantly. It consists of a manifold with holes along the top laid across the bottom of a channel or stream. When compressed air is forced through the holes in the manifold, a curtain of bubbles rises and produces horizontal currents on the water surface. The horizontal current moving upstream produces a stagnation zone in which oil can be trapped. Air barriers are very effective when the current is very low but the complicated water circulation pattern which is shown in these large-scale tests can entrain oil downward if there is any current in the main stream. Air barriers have an important role in the containment of oil spills. One advantage is that they don't interfere with boats. Here's another way to keep oil from spreading. It's a surface tension modifier. When placed on the water surface next to an oil slick, the oil will run from it 
and the area covered will be reduced many times its original size. With the oil spill reduced in size and controlled, recovery is greatly simplified. Rapid deployment of the material is one of its advantages. A spray helicopter can deliver the material to a spill and apply it in a matter of minutes. Only a small quantity need be used. Apply it as a coarse spray on the water at the edge of the spill. Almost any power boat is also suitable for applying the material. Applied to the edge of a spill, the oil moves away from it and is concentrated, making it much easier to pick up with skimmers or sorbent materials. As with booms and other containment methods, a surface tension modifier should only be used if plans have been made to clean up the spilled oil. By itself, this material can only keep the oil from spreading, and this will only last for a matter of hours at most. Other equipment will be needed to remove the oil from the water surface. But one more thing, you need to obtain approval from governmental regulatory agencies before using any chemicals. Well, so far, you've learned how oil properties and environmental conditions can affect what is done to contain oil on water. You've had a look at a half dozen or so booms, a look at the air barrier, and a look at surface tension modifiers. We're now at the point in our story where you have the oil spill under control. But what are you going to do with it? There are some pretty sophisticated pieces of equipment, as well as some pretty simple gadgets to help you. Let's take a look. One of the oldest means of removing oil from water was by means of sponges to absorb the oil. Nowadays, there are many absorbents available to pick up oil spills, including straw, foamed plastics, and many others. Many materials have been tested and their ability to pick up oil has been carefully measured. The results of this research can be seen in this graph. Polyurethane foam has by far the greatest absorption capabilities of the materials tested. In general, the lower the density of the absorbent, the more oil it can pick up per unit weight. When an absorbent is first placed on water, it will usually float owing to its low bulk density. However, many absorbents tend to become waterlogged in time, as shown in this time-lapse sequence. The air pockets which originally provided buoyancy may become filled with water and then the water soaked mass will sink. This will even happen with some materials such as straw if the mass becomes oil soaked. Only a few solid materials such as polypropylene or polyethylene, which in solid forms are less dense than water, will float indefinitely. Polyurethane foam will float indefinitely because some of the cells in the foam are completely closed, making it permanently buoyant. For ease of handling and placement on small spills, absorbents are sometimes packaged in shapes and sizes which can be deployed by one man. Distributing straw and polyurethane foam on water can be done readily with a mulcher, such as is often used by state highway departments for seeding highway right-of-ways. Wind, under some conditions, can be a deterrent to the operation.
Recovery of oil-soaked absorbents often requires a great deal of manual labor and is quite slow. Pitchforks are often the only practical tool. For larger operations, ingenious modifications to conventional power equipment have often been fabricated. A screen can be used to pick up absorbent materials. Moving mesh belts can be used to increase the rate of recovery. Consideration might also be given to modifying the vessels used to cut aquatic weeds in lakes or to harvest kelp along our coasts. Oil can also be removed from the water surface by means of mechanical skimming devices. There are several different types of skimmers available, each of which has its own advantages and disadvantages. The effectiveness of any skimmer will depend on several factors, including the thickness of the oil layer. If the oil layer becomes very thin, the rate of arrival of oil at the entrance to the skimmer will be limited, and the overall rate of oil recovery will go down. One way to get around this problem is to tow or propel the skimmer into the oil mass using booms to form a V to divert the oil to the skimmer. The skimmer must be properly adjusted so that it may operate as efficiently as possible. A major problem in the operation of any skimmer, especially in inland or sheltered waters, is debris, including trash, sticks, leaves, paper, and so forth. Sometimes the best solution is to use a trash screen built around the skimmer. Skimmers have to be handled by people. They must be rugged and must be simple to operate even by relatively unskilled workmen. Light weight for ease of handling is very desirable. Pumps for use with skimmers should be self-priming and should have open passageways to avoid becoming clogged with debris. There are three basic types of skimmers. The weir skimmer, floating suction, and sorbent surface. The weir type skimmer depends on gravity to drain the oil off the surface of the water. The oil is then contained in a sump below the surface from which it may be pumped to a storage area. A number of different types of weir skimmers are available ranging in size from the very small to large barge types. Simplicity and mobility are among the advantages of the weir-type skimmer. However, the efficiency of any weir-type skimmer decreases very rapidly when in waves, and the smaller units may actually be swamped. The floating suction skimmer is similar in many ways to the weir skimmer. It can easily be put into action. You just put it on the water and adjust so that it will float at the oil-water interface. Because it has very little draft and is generally quite compact, it can be used in very shallow water and in confined areas under docks. Again, self-priming pumps should be used. Frequently, both this type skimmer and the suction type skimmer, like the weir, works best in calm water. As the water surface gets choppy, it rapidly loses its effectiveness as air channels into the suction hose. 
and it can also become clogged by debris. A third type of skimmer uses a surface to which oil can stick, such as a disc or a drum or an endless belt, to pick up the oil off the water surface. This type of skimmer is called a sorbent surface skimmer. This type is less vulnerable to wave action than either the weir type skimmer or the floating suction skimmer. However, the sorbent surface skimmers are usually more expensive and may be less available than either of the other types of skimmers we have discussed. Also, the operators may need more training in order to operate them efficiently. Oil and water won't mix. Well, usually not for very long. But if we add a chemical dispersant, in a sense, oil and water do mix. The successful use of a dispersant will cause the oil to remain in suspension in water, so that in time, nature will take care of it by bacterial action. Also, dispersants can be very important in minimizing fire hazards. Again, a word of caution. As with any chemical, you must obtain approval for its use from the regulatory agencies. A major problem with the use of dispersants is to provide enough mixing energy. It is simple to do in a laboratory, but how about in real life? How would you achieve results in large spills? How would you agitate it? One way is to use a mixing board towed by a boat. Wave action may also do the job. Another way of disposing of oil on water is to burn it. It can be burned providing that it is supplied with oxygen and providing that it can be kept hot enough. The problem in an oil spill is that the thin layer of oil is cooled by the water, making it nearly impossible to ignite. This kerosene lamp can illustrate a way of igniting oil on water. The wick is the trick. A wicking agent which will insulate the oil from the cool water below. There are several wicking agents commercially available. The one shown here is polyurethane foam. There are disadvantages to burning, such as the resulting air pollution and fire hazards, both of which must be kept in mind. Owing to the fire hazards, Burning of oil is not usually practical on sheltered waters, although it may be desirable to burn oil on the open seas. It is also possible to dispose of floating oil by sinking it. Sand or other solid materials can be used. Special treatment of the sand can make it more effective. Multiply this billions of times and you have the sand sink method of disposing of oil on water. It can be used to treat very large spills quite rapidly, although use is usually limited to spills far offshore. Disadvantages of the sand sink method of treating oil spills include low efficiency, only about 85% of the oil can be sunk, and contamination of the ocean bottom with oil. Because of the problem of contamination, Use of the sand sink method is restricted in certain areas. This has been a brief summary of oil spill control techniques. You have been shown how environmental conditions can affect the behavior of oil spilled on water. You have also seen that the properties of oil may vary and how they change as the oil weathers and how these properties can affect the recovery of spilled oil. We have discussed containment, the construction of booms, and which types may work best under certain conditions. Air barriers and their limitations, and surface tension modifiers. You have seen several ways in which spilled oil may be removed from the surface. By absorption, by skimming, by dispersing, 
by burning and by sinking. Don't forget that quick response and proper action are the important factors in oil spill handling, planning and training. Having the proper equipment on hand and regular training and practice with it are as necessary in minimizing the effects of oil spills as they are in containing fires. Know your oil spill emergency duties and equipment as well as you know your firefighting assignment. A wide variety of equipment is available for handling oil spills. When handled properly and when used in the proper combination with other equipment, it can do a good job of efficiently cleaning up spills. Remember, your friends and neighbors are depending on you. By doing your job, you can make this possible. You can make this possible. Make this possible. possible.